My name is Diana Franklin, and I'm from UC Santa Barbara. And my talk today is on a summer program that we're running called Animal Platoque uh, to attract target, specific target groups to computer science through socially relevant themes. And this work is uh, in conjunction with Philip Conrad, another colleague in computer science, as well as Gerardo Aldana, who's in Chicano Studies. All right, so as I think most Googlers are aware, uh, there is a, is a concern in computer science about the participation of females and minorities. Uh, when you compare it to a lot of other fields, even some technical fields, uh, we fall, fall short. So if you look into why, sort of what the statistics are, well, females now earn over 50% of college degrees, yet only 15% of the computer science degrees. And Latinos earn only 7% of CS degrees, but make up 14% of the population. So the participation certainly is not representative of the total population. But why is this? Well, in the, uh, for females, they're going to college getting degrees, but not in computer science. So it's a lack of interest, experience, and or confidence. For Latinos, um, and by the way, the at symbol is the shortcut I learned for A slash O. It's very exciting. I think it looks a lot more cool than putting A slash O everywhere. So I am, I have adopted that and am using that. I don't know how official that is, but it looks nice. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, but for Latinos, it's not that entirely that they're choosing other fields, but that they're not getting bachelor's degrees at all. So if you look at the problem of the Latinos, it's that there's a lack of preparation for college at all. Um, but the female, the Latinas, are actually going to college in higher numbers than the Latinos, but again, choosing non-technical fields. So uh, our motivation was to try to, try to get more uh, Females and Latinos in computer science. The reason we chose Latinos is we're in Santa Barbara, and that's our largest minority population. So a lot has been done on this before. Uh, there are a lot of outreach activities. CS Unplugged is free. It's non-computer-based activities. There's a Lego language to build Legos. Um, there's something called a Pleo dinosaur that you get to program the dinosaur's reactions to how you interact with it. And Georgia Tech has found that that's really exciting for girls, but they're incredibly expensive. Um, and then there are programming, as programming languages that have been designed, Scratch, Alice, and then, of course, summer camps and some cultural programs. So we sort of looked at all this. And of course, the problem in computer science is we have no popsicle bridge. When I'm at an outreach activity with all these other sciences, the kids don't want to come to me because I don't have any goo. I don't have any, you know, I don't have the draw that the other kids have using CS Unplugged activities, unfortunately. Um, and so I found that 30-minute things are not that useful for outreach for computer science. So we designed a, a two-week camp. Um, and we wanted it to be completely different. Right. So what we, we came up with for our summer program was that our goal is really to increase interest, to sort of take down the barriers that are preventing people from going, not trying to make them go. So we're trying to increase interest. And the only way we decided we could really int increase interest was to attract people who didn't already want to do computers. So we did not make a computer camp. Well, OK, we, we made a computer camp, but we did not advertise that we had made a computer camp. So it was important that we pick themes that had nothing to do with computers in order to convince them to come. And also, we wanted to have guest speakers to show how computer science positively impacts the world. The second step was for the Latinos, we had to have it be early enough that they had time to change their study habits to make sure that they would get in the right classes so that they could go to college. And it turns out that the, eighth, the classes you're in in eighth grade have the strongest correlation to whether or not you'll go to college. So we decided to target previous to eighth grade. So we're getting sixth through eighth, the summer, summer before sixth through eighth grade. And we're teamed up with a long-term academic support program that's already at UCSB that reaches out to students um, to try to get them the right academic advising, teach their parents how to advocate for them in the schools, just teach them about the American school system in general. And then the third one was to build confidence through successful projects, programming projects. So then we had to pick themes. We thought, OK, animals. Girls love animals. So for the females, we chose animals. And uh, so we even we integrated baby beanies into our camp. Um, and even the boys like that aspect. 
And then to try to convince the parents, we, we made it not just animals, but actually endangered species and conservation. Because, uh, well, California and Santa Barbara is no exception, uh, is very environmentally conscious. We have the oil rigs right outside that people are worried about another oil spill. So we do have a lot of um, activists in Santa Barbara. So for the Latinos, we chose Mayan culture. OK, so animals plus Mayan culture plus computers equals our camp. And if you look closely, what kind of tree is that? It's a binary tree. <gasps> OK, so anyway, that's our, our little graphic for our camp. Um, and so the way we got the name, Platoke actually is the, a Mayan term for the ruler of, the, of a pre-Hispanic state. So the word literally means speaker, but it's actually a king. Okay. So the big part was advertising. So in our advertising, actually it does say computer science, so we weren't totally lying, um, because our actually Gerardo Aldana, he has two daughters, and he asked them whether they would be disinclined to go to a camp if it mentioned computer science. And they said, no, no, we'd still be interested. So we decided to not leave it out entirely. Uh, but the focus is definitely on uh, animals and Mayan culture. And we did, for the seventh graders, we actually were able to do targeted mailings to only females and Latinos. And then for the elementary schools, we just had to give flyers to everybody and hope that the themes would attract the students we wanted. So we got 46 applicants. We ended up with 36 attendees. And only three of those were not in either target group. Yay. So we were quite happy about that. So when we implemented the camp, we have them work in pairs. So they're doing pair programming. And they each get a little netbook, not to take, not to keep, but um, they worked on a laptop. But they did get a beanie baby representing the endangered species that they were going to work on. And each endangered animal was from Mesoamerica, which is the area that Aztecs and Mayans lived in. Um, and so we, we were actually doing Mesoamerican culture, but all of our Advertising says Mayan culture because we were assured that then people would know what we were talking about. So that's why um, everything says Mayan. Yes? Did you So what I did was I, some people had friends. And so on the application, they can say, it says, do you have a friend attending? If so, put their name here. So if they had a friend, I paired them up by friend. And then we did only pair males together and females together. We did not make any male-female pairs. And we tried to pair them by age and sort of by school. So um, mostly, yeah, so it was not random, definitely not random. And I found in teaching, I do pair programming, and I never let it be random if they don't know each other. I always pair them myself. Any other questions? OK. So now that's a picture of all the Beanie Babies. They were quite excited about the Beanie Babies, actually. We, we weren't sure. But when we asked them, they said, oh, no, no. We, we like the Beanie Babies. And they all took them home with them. So then the question is, well, OK, what, how can we combine these with a set of cohesive activities? So what we did was we, uh, all of the, uh, they would learn something about mind culture or about art. We taught them how to draw animals, um, how to draw landscapes, how to do different things with the drawing. And then they would. we made a visit to the Santa Barbara Zoo to learn about animal conservation. Um, we did a whole bunch of mind culture activities that could be integrated into stories. So their, their scratch projects then, um, they could integrate both animals and or mind culture into their projects. So their first project was a name poem. So they took the letters of their animal and then they put an adjective with it. And it had two requirements. It had to respond to some button push or mouse click. So usually they would have it be if you clicked the letter, then the word would appear. And then they had, some, had something moving on the screen. Something had to move somehow. So maybe the owl would fly past or something. So that one, that example is owl. And then the next one was animal characteristics. So they looked, had to look up where does their animal live? What type of environment? Swamp, water? forest, things like that. What does it eat? Why is it endangered? Things like that. So they had a worksheet they had to fill out with all that information. And then they had to make a scratch animation that had, uh, it had to have two scenes, was the only requirement above and beyond the name poem. So it also interacted with the user in some way, and it told things about 
the animal. And a lot of kids chose to record some of the stuff. So they would say something about their animal. And then if you clicked on it, it would say that thing about the animal. But it had to do the scene change. And then the third project was to tell a story about your animal. And that's when they could really, they learned about, uh, each of them learned a story, a Mayan story about their animal. So they could choose to do that. Or they could choose to make up some story, like about how a deer got the white on its tail or something like that. Um, and so, and it also had to have multiple scenes. So this one was just a more fun way of integrating all of the scratch concepts they had already learned and integrate the Mayan things. And then the final project was just at the very end, they could choose between doing a Mayan ball game. They would be working with an undergraduate. They, it was too sophisticated for them to program themselves. So they'd be working with the undergraduate to suggest uh, changes to the program, and then maybe they'd be able to work on those changes. And then doing a virtual pet. There's a nifty assignment on the nifty assignment work, um, webpage at Stanford that does uh, finite state machines for a freshman level class using virtual pets. So we used that, taught them finite state diagrams, and then had them make their own virtual pet. And we get, let them choose, and, and they actually chose entirely along gender lines. So uh, all but one of the boy pairs chose the Mayan ball game, and then all of the female pairs plus one boy pair uh, chose the virtual pet. So, oh, yes? So, oh, okay. So the question was, how long did each assignment take approximately? So um, we had our camp um, made into 40-minute segments. So the name poem took two, I think, two 40-minute segments plus another uh, free time to work on it. So I think in three 40-minute segments, they completed the name poems. And then the animal characteristics probably took another three as well. Um, and then the storytelling took more. We took, gave them more time for that. And then the Mayan ball game and virtual pet, they didn't actually have time to finish. So um, that one, it would be hard for me to, what we did was we gave them the, for the virtual pet, we gave them a skeleton that had a virtual pet, a particular bird with a particular finite state diagram. And then we just had them, um, they could choose to do their finite state diagram and their picture or they could add something to that one. So that was sort of experimental. We're, we're going to revisit that to see if we did it, can do it better next time. But um, we didn't quite have enough time for the last ones. Yes? Did everyone show everyone else what they did at each stage? Ah, good question. Did everyone show everyone else what they did at each stage? What we did was every once in a while we would have volunteers do show and tell. And so a couple, maybe three or four groups would show what they did at the end of the 40-minute segment. So sometimes it would be the finished project, or sometimes it would just be what they'd done by then. Uh, I think that this year what we're going to do is what's called a li gallery walk. So we'll have everybody put their computers around the room, and one partner can stay with the computer, and the other partner can walk around and see all of them and then get suggestions, and then they can swap, and the one person stays. So we are going to have more equal and larger opportunity for sharing this time around. Any other questions? Because it seemed like the same kids wanted to share every time. We're like, uh, someone else? OK, so they did fun projects, but did it really work? Well, the first one was the recruiting. The recruiting really did work. Um, we only had, if you look at this chart, it's a little hard to see. But um, everyone, ex oh, we only had, of the students who attended and completed the camp, we only had two. Caucasian males. Everybody else was in our target group. And we didn't filter the applications. We didn't have quite enough applicants to turn anyone down. So the first summer, we actually accepted everyone. Um, this summer, we have at least twice as many applications, maybe more, uh, than we have room for. So we actually will be filtering. So then we asked them why they had applied for the camp. What was it that they were most interested in? And we divided it along. Um, this one is divided along ethnic lines. So, so the question is, well, so we were anticipating that uh, the Latinos would be more interested in the Mayan culture and that maybe the non-Latinos would be more interested in either computer science or uh, animals and endangered species. But that ended up not being the case. 
So you can see here that under Mayan culture, it was almost equal between Latinos and non-Latinos as to which what they were interested in. So it turns out that it was somewhat of a draw, but not necessarily for that target group. So if we look along gender lines, it is much more along gender lines. The boys, of course, the boys are a very small sample set, right? There were only like six or two, six boys total in this that that signed the IRBs. To, so we actually had two more boys, but their parents didn't sign the IRB, so you can't see the results. Um, so mo almost all of the males were there for the computer science. Um, and for the females, it was very few of them for the computer science, but a lot of them for the animals. So this was sort of more expected. Uh, and so if we look at, uh, th this isn't, you don't need to look at this close, oh boy, that's, not showing up very well. Um, so we asked them th at the beginning of the camp, we said, oh, well, what, what are you interested doing in doing? And then at the end of the camp, we asked, what did you like doing? And luckily, uh, more people liked doing it than had been interested in doing it. So we actually, students really did enjoy the camp. They enjoyed the things we did uh, and along all of the subjects. All right. So the, these are the results we're most happy with. Uh, so we asked them at the beginning, uh, are you interested in computer science as a possible career? Are you, or is computer science your number one choice for a career? Um, do you think you are capable of being a computer scientist if you want to be? Do you think computer science is an inappropriate career for female, for girls? Um, are boys better at computer science than girls? and are girls better at computer science than boys? So at the beginning of the camp, seven students said they, were they would consider computer science, and three students said it was their first choice. They definitely wanted to be computer scientists. And all three of those were boys. Um, and then three students said they felt they were not capable of being a computer scientist. Um, two of the students said it was inappropriate for girls to be a computer scientist. And then, actually, just as many kids thought boys were better at computer science than girls were. So that was sort of surprising to me. Yes? Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm throwing I'm sorry, Are these attitudes mutually exclusive? You can only hold the students are only asked which of the one attitudes they held. No, 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 no. This, this was a series of questions. Yes, like series of questions and then... Um, well, the, okay, the boys are better at CS and the girls are better at CS. It was um, boys are better at CS, neither one, girls are better. So that one was a choice of, you could choose three choices, and we showed two of the responses. But all of the others were, um, well, so possible career, we just listed a whole bunch of careers, said what ones are you considering? and just let them check all the boxes. And we just counted how many said computer science. So we didn't specifically said, say, are you considering computer science? We just gave a huge number of choices. And then same with first choice. What, which career are you most interested in? And we had a whole bunch of choices. Um, and then not capable of being a computer scientist? I think that was a straight out question. Yes or no, you know, do you think girls, or do you think you are capable of being a computer scientist? We might have reworded it because capable my, and inappropriate. I don't think we use that wording either for this young of kids. Do you have an understanding as to why the girls are better at CS than Because you said that you're carrying with them by sexes. So it would, it would seem that the boys and the girls having different views upon of the different sexes would not change all that much. Oh, but they actually... Uh, so, okay, two, two things. One is that we had the show and tell. So the boys got to see what the girls were doing. Okay, so, so we were hoping that all these numbers would go down to zero. That by the end of the camp, everybody th would think it was all equal. Okay, that didn't happen. And in fact, oddly, of that five, the boys are better at CS, there's a girl in there who didn't think that at the beginning of the camp. So that's, that's sort of saddening. Um, but as to pairing a boy with a girl, what, what some studies have found is that uh, if you pair a boy with a girl, that actually lowers the girl's confidence in her own skills. So we didn't want to do that, because I think then the number could have gone up. Yeah. Um, but we were, what we were happy about was the first two rows, which is that at the end of the camp, so we have, this is the result of something in the 30s. So 21, almost two-thirds of the kids by the end of the camp w 
we're open to computer science as a career. Um, and that's triple what we start. Now, of course, these are not statistically relevant. It's a very small sample set, but we like to say tripled and doubled because it sounds good and it makes us feel better. Um, and then for CS being the first choice, it went from three to six, and there was a girl in that six. So we were happy about that too. Uh, okay. The rest of them were boys, I think. Some of them. So, oh, actually, they weren't all boys because we didn't have seven boys in the camp. Afterwards, we didn't have, oh, it could have been four boys. Yeah, I'm not sure. We, we had about eight boys in the camp. So, um, I, no, I guess it could have been all boys the first time and then half of them weren't. But yeah, so we would have preferred it go down to zero. Uh, okay. Okay, so the takeaways we got from this was that uh, if you're going to attract students, do it actually does work to think about even someone along stereotypical lines, what, what do I think this target population is going to like, um, and trying to build it around that interest, but integrate computing, integrate some fun computer activities into it, or computer programming activities into it. Um, and we were successful in leaving students excited about computing. Uh, this summer, we're going to spend more time trying to uh, look at exactly what computer science they learned. Did they learn conditionals? Did they learn variables? Did they learn event-driven programming? Things like that. Um, so we're going to do that. Um, but we're trying to do it in a way, we don't want to test them, so we're, we're going to have to work on exactly how to do it in this atmosphere. Okay. Um, and so, let's see what we learned. Oh yeah, and then it's very important to train the helpers. We had graduate students and undergraduates and uh, we're going to spend more time. Last year, we were sort of scrambling getting the curriculum ready. And so this year, we're going to get to spend a lot more time talking to them about how to, how to approach it, how to talk to the kids, things like that. Um, OK. And so actually, that's it. That's, my formal talk is only half an hour, um, but I left uh, time open for questions or discussion. Yes. How much computer science they learn, and how much they're just responding to the subject, sort of the, 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 um, the, the dressing, as it were. Right? I'm, I'm not going to insult girls by saying I know what middle school girls like, but let's say like you can talk to middle school boys and say, let's talk about the physics of a lightsaber, or let's do statistics based on football results, right? And you can sort of you can masquerade that for, I would say, probably the two minutes of your study, um, and they will feel like. You know, you say, well, we were just doing statistics, but it was like football, and they're like, wow, we're not football, so I must have statistics too, right? Um, so, so where, how are you going to actually going to try and extract how much of a procedural literacy they're taking away, and how much they're actually beginning to think in a procedural manner, um, think about computer science not as just this endangered animal thing or this mind thing that we sort of researched on the internet, but more about like the things that they're actually performing. Right. So. Okay, so I'm going to try to paraphrase the question into the microphone. So, so the yeah, so the question is, uh, how do we how do we make sure that in the two weeks we're not just sort of having a separation between animals, mind culture, and what they're doing, and and making it so that they're actually saying, oh, this is computer science. This, if I understand your question correctly. Um, so, so I think this year we're going to have more. Um, speakers come in to talk about how they're using computer science algorithms in their work to help the animals. So for example, one that we tried to get together last year, but we didn't have time, um, was that one of our colleagues is working on, um, so you have, you have an endangered, uh, the last set of lions or something. I can't remember exactly which animal it was. It was a large cat, I think, of some sort. And uh, they're in these sort of separate areas. And you want them, but if they only breed amongst themselves, then they're going to be susceptible to diseases. So what you want is to be able to create a path between the different areas where these animals are to make it easy for them to naturally go between them. And so they'll 
they'll genetically mix. Well, that sounds a lot like a shortest path algorithm. Okay, so so I, this is how we're going to do it. The you know we're going to tie sort of algorithms. CS Unplugged ties algorithms to sort of fun, meaningless problems. We're going to try to tie algorithms or things in procedural thinking to real pro, you know problems in. Uh, we're also going to have someone talk about how they use sensors uh, to gather data out in the field about the conservation. So it's not exactly procedural thinking, but at their level, you know, just even if they believe that that's computer science, that's a good thing too, because that's computer engineer, you know. So, so we're trying to make that tie very strong, definitely stronger this summer than we did last summer. Any other questions? Yeah. What kind of follow-up? Right. What kind of follow-up? So we we had them all get invited to that. Uh, academic counseling program for the long term. Uh, the word we got back was that not that many people took advantage of that. And so that I think we had the people come and give talks, but the talks were boring. They were, they were not, they did not make the kids want to join this program. So I think maybe next time we'll have our, our people give the talks about what you get out of joining this program and try to push them harder about joining the program and then try to see we'll we'll contact them later not all of them have email addresses so so long getting feedback a year later is definitely challenging for some of the students um, we did have uh, my colleague phil conrad he ran an evening thing for a few of the kids and they learned they did more in scratch and then did python and so we sort of tried a few things this first year, and then we'll make more decisions on exactly how to do it after this summer. And some of the kids reapplied to come back. So we're now working on, for that small set of kids, what are we going to have them do the second summer? Because it'll be focused only on computer science this time for them, um, mostly anyway. Uh, so what are we going to have them do that can go more advanced? Right. Right. The question was, uh, what sorts of things did we do to get the parents involved? So on the last day in the evening, we had a, an open house, and all the parents were invited to come and see their kids' uh, projects. And it was sort of funny because there was one where he had not wanted to go to the camp, and his mom made him go to the camp, and he would come home each day just dragging his feet. She'd say, "How was it?" He'd be like, Meh. and then all of a sudden, he's like, "By the way, there's this open house." And she came, and he was all excited. He's like, look at what I did. And she had no idea that he never told her in the entire two weeks that he was having fun. And even though by the third day, his partner was at home, it hadn't come. So he had to do it himself. And then he got really excited, and he really, really liked it. Um, so yeah, the open house was really good for that parent. <laughs> yeah. Um, so Scratch and Alice are very similar in some, the question was um, Scratch and Alice are two programs that maybe you've heard about as being targeted towards middle schoolers and she was wondering if I had sort of a quick tutorial on the two. So Alice is actually, if you download it, uh, unless you do something special and get out of it, you start in a tutorial. So there's a really quick tutorial, so so you can just do that. You can download Alice on your computer and you can just start the tutorial. It's the idea of both of them is drag and drop. You don't type stuff in. You the, all the the constructs, all the um, function calls and the constructs are on the left, and you drag them over on the right into the program, and then you choose from a list. So you can see this on the can you see my mouse? Yeah. On the left, these are all the cho it's really small, but these are all the choices of things you can do. And then here's a program, and it's a sequence of items. And you can you have different things like what to do if you do the press space bar. So there's event-driven programming at the beginning, or this is what I want to happen when I start the program. And it's it's a list, and then you can choose sounds or things like that, or loops, and and you can't have a syntax error. That's the big key, and that, and all your, a lot of your choices are easy to find on your left. 
So it's, it's much easier than typing in and gets rid of a lot of the frustration. And they're both visually based. So here you can see this is a drawing. So Scratch is two-dimensional, and it's much easier to integrate your own new things into it, whereas Alice is neat because it's 3D, but it's really hard to add your own 3D object into it. You're sort of, in my opinion, you're limited to what they provided in their libraries, which are a lot of fun things. But this way you can draw your own, you know, that's, that's, supposed, that's the story of the rabbit and the hare up there. So the person drew, drew a rabbit, drew a hare, and then told the story. Yes. We did, the question was, did we adjust the curriculum as we went along? We did, especially that virtual pet. So the first time it was presented, it was way, it, maybe two-thirds of the students got it and they could go off and running, and the other third were just totally lost. And so then she, the net, so because it's in 40 minute blocks, and you only get it a 40 minute block once that day, like we have a whole bunch of different things that are going on in the same day. So she had time to go home that night and go, okay, how am I gonna present this again to the kids who didn't get it so that they'll get it this time? Because she had to introduce variables and control structures, which they hadn't done before. And so she came back the second day and she did it again for those kids. And they pretty much got it the second time around, though they didn't have quite enough time to fully integrate it now that it was the end of the camp now. So yes, yeah, so now we can use what she learned about how she presented it the first time, and she'll do it that way the first time. Oh, so in the classroom, so. Um, we had sort of made it so that you could, sometimes we split the kids in two groups of 20, and so we had two graduate students. Um, we had wanted to get one computer science graduate student and one non, one mind culture graduate student, but computer scientists have a lot more lucrative options in the summer, so we couldn't get any. So we have two graduate students that are both on the mind culture side, and then all, almost all of the undergraduates now are computer scientists. So, so last summer we had a lot of students because we had some students who were doing it for units instead of getting paid. So I think we had something like six undergraduates and two graduate students. So we had, we had sort of an army of people. Um, and then this summer we still have two graduate students, but we'll, we'll have three, no, three computer science undergrads and one non-computer science undergrad. So we have six people in the classroom, plus one faculty member is there at all times. Yes, so every time, so one person is giving the lesson at the beginning, but every lesson, every 40 minute lesson is sort of a tutorial. So the person stands up and shows them something, and then they work on their own for 10 minutes or so. And so then the rest of the people go around and help people out. And so there was a lot, yeah, there was a lot of help going on at all times. Yeah. Yes, so there was a lot of creativity involved. Uh, so the question was, uh, because they were fairly open-ended projects, uh, did that spur creativity, and was I impressed? Were we impressed by what some of the students did? Um, yes. So they were they were intended to be open-ended because we wanted to. And actually, next year we'll have actually checklists because sometimes it made it so then the kids just did nothing, like sort of they didn't know what they were supposed to be doing. So we're going to write the requirements down this year. Um, but uh, yeah, some some of the students did really fun things. I. I can't remember exactly. So I was actually on bed rest the whole. That's part of why not everything got done that would have gotten done because I was basically taken out of the equation. So there were only two faculty members instead of three. Um, so I was not personally there much of the time. I only came, I was only able to come in a few times. So um, but the the word I got was that the projects were really cool. <laughs> and some students even stayed in during the breaks. They're like, oh no, we wanna, we wanna work on this more. We have to get it done. Uh, and they would have to kick them out for lunch. Like, no, you guys need to go eat lunch. Uh, so, yeah. And those are the kids that we wanna, when we choose who's coming back, we'll look at you know, how motivated were they? What did their projects look like? Because we don't want the kids who's, whose parents were sort of using it as daycare who weren't, who didn't really care. 
we're, we don't want to accept those back for a second summer because we have so few slots and a lot of kids who want to come. Well, okay, the way we did the curriculum was that we each lesson was 40 minutes, and so we would have like a mind culture lesson and an animal lesson and a, you know, and then we would have, in the afternoon, we would have a speaker or something, CS Unplugged, some special thing, and then time to work on your projects. So when you, so what we ended up doing was, it was very rare that in the, it did happen, but usually you wouldn't get two lessons, two, two scratch lessons on the same project in the same day. So that means that that person would be able to make some changes by the next day. New, yeah, I have a more general question. Just where do we go from here? Where do we go from middle school up? Because I've delivered presentations to high schools about computer science about video games, and you can just see in their eyes that their minds are already made up as to whether they have any interest in at all. Then when I TA undergraduate sort of freshman classes, general education, we can't get girls in for love nor money. Um, what right. high school has lost them by then? Um, and we start to hear we're at middle school, but what about the in between? So um, if we could do this larger scale, you know, so if someone participated in middle school and sort of became more open to computer science, I think they'd be more willing so to do something in high school, like on cell phone apps. That's, I mean, something that I think social applications are very uh, attractive to females. And so if they could, if they had something at the high school level that they could get involved in, then I think they'd be much more likely. I mean, we do, we clearly have a gap here. Uh, and, and the reason we chose this age was because of that eighth grade critical pivot point for the Latinos. So if, if we had only been targeting females, we would have done a high school program. Um, high school programs, though, are challenging because it means you can't have a summer job. And so Georgia Tech runs a huge number of summer camps, but their high school ones are the most challenging because uh, especially the low socioeconomic students can't really do it. Yeah. Um, long term, I mean, I think it would be better if more of this were integrated into the school curricula so that, you know, in school you've got calculus and hopefully they're saying those football things, but unfortunately they tend to use a lot of male-oriented examples in, in a lot of those areas, which I think there are perfectly good ones. It's just that the teachers aren't using them because somehow the female things are sissy or something, whereas the male ones are cool. And so I think if it were a little more balanced in high school, um, there's a push now, Jan Cooney at, at NSF, well, no longer at NSF, has started this push to get um, algorithmic thinking integrated better into K through 12 education so that it doesn't have to be a separate computer science class. They're doing the thought processes the whole way along and so it's more like, so they gain the confidence early on. That's not something I can do personally this summer. <laughs> but yeah, there, there are a lot of a lot of people are working on what we need to do, and I'm actually part of the California push to get to train teachers and try to figure out how to change it in California um, longer term. Any other questions? Okay. Great. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.